Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Tonal Talk. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Normally, I give everyone a couple minutes to join and I give some updates. But tonight, I really want to maximize the amount of time we have with our guests. So we're going to get right into it. I'm going to give everyone 10 seconds. I'm going to pin this to the top so everyone can find it. There we go. All right, let's see. Welcome. People are starting to join. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Christy. Hi, Anya. Uh, so tonight's tonal talk is a little bit different. Um, and to be completely honest and upfront with you all, I'm scared. I'm scared to moderate this discussion. I'm scared to to breach this topic. But um, I shared that on my pre-call with Coach Jared and Coach Paul today. And you know what? They expressed the exact same thing. We're all a little bit nervous. It's um, it's uncomfortable. It's difficult to talk about race, to talk about racism, to talk about injustice, no matter what color your skin is. But um, saying the wrong thing is better than saying nothing at all. And for too long, we've been saying nothing at all. I've been saying nothing at all. And so that's changing tonight. And we're starting this conversation. We're having this hard conversation. And I just want everyone to come with an open mind and an open heart and just to listen and learn. Some things that might come up might be uncomfortable. They might uh, sh sh kind of shake what you believe in to your core. Um, and I invite you to just sit with that. And instead of reacting in the comments or just turning it off or leaving the group, I invite you to just examine what was said that made you feel that way. Um, and just, to, again, just listen. Um, the perspectives that I'm gonna share, Jared's gonna share, Paul's gonna share, they're just that. They're our own perspectives, our own experiences. They might be different than what you've experienced before. We're not speaking on behalf of anyone or any organization or any type of person. Um, we're just having a conversation. And so I thank you for being here. Um, I invite you to listen and we appreciate you. So with that being said, I'm gonna introduce my guest tonight. Coach Paul has worked in the fitness industry full throttle for five years. Um, he's worked as a large and small group fitness instructor and personal trainer in big box gyms and personal private gyms. Um, he's worked for companies such as uh, Barry's Bootcamp. He started his own company called uh, Get Right Fitness. And of course, you know him on Tonal. He, it, before working in fitness, he was a collegiate athlete and a professional football player. So he's been around the block in terms of the fitness industry for sure. He's known on Tonal for his no-nonsense uh, coaching style and uh, the athletic moves and the high energy that he brings to his workouts and his programs. Um, you may know Coach Jared from his, the positive vibes that he brings to his Tonal High Intensity classes. Um, he has worked in the fitness industry for a whopping 16 years. I didn't even know he was that old. <laughs> uh, he started as a teen in the weight room, racking those weights, and he worked his way up. He now owns his own personal training and group fitness company called Inspired Method. Um, and we are super happy to have both of them on. So. Without further ado, please welcome Coach Jared and Coach Paul. There we go. Good evening, gentlemen. Hello. What's up? What's up? Thank you so much for being here um, and for sharing a little bit of yourselves with us in the community tonight. Anytime. So let's get started. Um, so, Paul. You came to me with the idea to have a conversation about your experience being a black man in the fitness industry about maybe two months ago. Uh, so before George Floyd's murder, before the protests, uh, you wanted to talk about this. And to be completely honest, I was scared. I thought it was a good idea. And I said, yeah, maybe for the next Black History Month. Uh, but I was wrong. <coughs> and I appreciate you for, I appreciate, we had a very honest conversation and uh, I learned a lot. And so thank you for that. And so I just wanted to open this with um, giving you the opportunity to say why you came to me with that idea in the first place. Well, thank you, Kay. Um, I think when I came to you with that idea in the first place, I don't know. I, I, for me, it might have just been me just wanting, I might have been inspired by something I did, something I saw. And I'm like, I want to inspire somebody else too. And I said, this could be a cool story as far as my mindset with things like that, but it was more so it came out of inspiration of me seeing something or I don't know, I felt inspired and I feel like my story in itself is very inspiring. And I just, I know that the tonal talks have been so successful that we've done so impactful. And I thought, even though, you know, the narrative wasn't what it is now, I thought this would be a great time for me to tell people about my blackness and my story and all that. But again, you know, it, we, we, we learn these lessons and it's better late than never because now we're here and we're unpeeling all these layers. So, 
you told me uh, fear is a lack of faith and that stuck with me. <clears throat> and I have faith in you and us in this community to have this conversation. So thank you. Yeah, that's like, that was the quote from my senior year of high school football. Like our like team quote was fear is a lack of faith. So that's like it's stuck with me ever since then. I'm gonna write up a t-shirt or something. <laughs> oh, I, ha I have one. I should, my mom has it. Fears of like a friend 15 years ago. And Jared, what would you like people to uh, come to this tonal talk with and get out of it? Uh, yeah, you know, I think for me, um, I think one of the most powerful things that I've been able to experience is to actually take a step back <clears throat> to slow down with all of my own thoughts and preconceived notions and to actually be okay with hearing someone else's perspective, even if it uh, directly contradicts my own. Um, so I think I think for me, as, I, as I've been struck and, and it's really made an impact on me to hear other people's story, I think that it, that's what I would like to do. Uh, that's what we would like to do is, as I think it's important that we share our experiences. Uh, we're coming to you as individuals who basically want the same things as everybody else. We want to do well in life. We want to contribute to society. We want to make a lot of money. We want to be loved. We want to feel like we belong. And some of those fundamental things we have been getting or haven't at all been getting, or maybe we haven't been getting at a consistent level due to the way that society is or the way that we have been experiencing our lives. And I just think that if we're going to make change, if we're really serious about being better as a people, then this is the way to do it. And it's not only about sharing our story and, and, and talking about the different experiences that we've had, but then um, I want to really encourage people to not just let this movement be this incredible living entity for two weeks and then we just go back and everything's normal and then another police officer kills an unarmed black person and then there's even more. If we don't, if we don't take the moments to actually affect change, there has to be lasting change. And so those are really my two purposes, sharing and <clears throat> lasting change, structural change. Uh, that's what I would like. Absolutely. We should make this a uh, every couple months conversation, I think. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think uh, what, what you said is people can find the commonalities in the stories and also experiences the differences, which I think is an important distinction. Like we have not had the same experiences in growing up in America, but we also have common goals and common themes running between us, which I think is really beautiful. Absolutely. Uh, so the first kind of topic I want to cover is um, it's a pretty obvious one, I think, and it's it's the lack of representation of black people within the fitness industry. Um, if you Google, and I encourage everyone right now, go Google fit person or fit woman or fit male or squats or push-ups or anything fitness related, you're gonna see rows and rows and rows of basically white chiseled muscular people. I, I wanna hear from you, Paul, um, why you think this is problematic? Uh, Cause I'll hear people say, you know, well, what about Serena Williams or Michael Jordan? Sure, there's plenty of, you know, black athletes and black people in sports. But when you go to your local yoga, many of us, when we go to our local yoga studio or spin class, <coughs> a lot of white bodies, white faces, white people in the staff and in the classes as well. So, Paul, as a group fitness instructor, as a personal trainer, as a black man, why is diversity important within the fitness industry and representation? Well, for me, I always go back to the mindset of a kid or I put myself in a kid's shoes. Because if I'm a black kid in America, <clears throat> excuse me, and I see an industry where people, it looks cool, but not everyone looks like me. Again, it's gonna look cool, but I may not have the urge or want to go in there. It's just, it's gonna really, you may think you're not capable or qualified to do things that you are capable God gives us gifts, and if we don't shoot for things, we won't really know that. But if you're a kid and you see that no one looks like you in that industry or that realm, it will be, you might hesitate to go there or try to attempt to go for that career or that life goal. And for me, I just the, the intent with me getting into fitness wasn't, oh, my, all my people are here. I want to be with my people. It was, because again, in the, in the Black narrative, I think in America, a lot of people that are from here just want to get up high because that's where the white people, that's where the money is. So I looked at it as, oh, this is predominantly white. I could be successful. And that's how I look at, I mean, not now, my life is changing, but back in the day, that's how a lot of people could look at opportunities 
when it isn't when it doesn't have to do with sports or music or anything creative, you know, in that realm, in that world, it's, I mean, if I get with these white people, I can be successful, but I just don't think it's in, I think it's important in fitness specifically that, you know, it gets more colorful, it looks different so that kids can look at it at a young age and be able to think of that as, ah, oh, I can be, I can, just like they think of wanting to be an astronaut or be a doctor, they see how inclusive and cool this job is, that, that can be like a one of the goals that kids say in school. So that's when I always come back to that. I want to make sure that people look at big companies and can see themselves in that because it's still, that's not there. So that's why I think it's important that we are represented more for the youth. And so that the even white kids can cannot think that this is just for my people so they can see that this is for everybody too, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Jerry, did you want to add something as well? I just, um, I, I think that's really well said. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think I think representation is massively important. Um, I think I think that one thing that representation also does. I think I, I can't really add too much more to what you said, Paul. But I think that as as representation um, shows different skin tones, different backgrounds, ethnicities, and cultures, um, that that does add to the flavor in a way that should provoke inspiration. That should provoke. Um, it, it, it should provoke. Um, Everyone, and particularly white people, rather than being threatened by seeing, um, you know, several colored people within the realm and the mix, rather appreciate the differences. And, and to me, when, when you get sort of the same flavor and only one flavor, um, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a way to sort of control certain avenues where we're only allowing a certain amount of exposure. We're only going to let you see this. This is what we want it to continue to be. Um, so there's that control aspect. But but you're also, you're losing out on so much that you don't even realize. And, and you can then learn some more and elevate your own self. It just seems to me like with representation, not only are black and colored folks going to benefit, but everyone's going to benefit because it's going to lift all parties um, to higher quality, more creation. And, and, there's, and eventually, if that's, if that's your goal, more money or more growth, uh, more of that as well. So uh, to me, it, it only makes things uh, better when you continue to include all different shapes and sizes. Absolutely. And I would also add, there's kind of this like archetype or fetishism of the black athlete body, I would say, that black men especially are, they're good for athletics and that's it. And some, some people might hold that belief. And so the more people of color we can bring into the mix and share the stories and share the differences, we start to see the different archetypes that people can be. They're not just Single. They're not just single one silo. They don't just fill a one stereotype. Yeah, I always tell I always tell people for me that I'm more than my body because you can see me and you can think you know me, but you don't. So I'm more than these muscles and the body I've developed. Because again, you know, there's a stereotype that is t is attached to the way a bigger, darker, hairier man might look. You know, but again, yeah, more than how I physically look. That's what I always tell people. Didn't you uh, share that you had an experience where you were told not to wear like tank tops? <clears throat> like that was that something that you want to so talk about? It, it wasn't for me. I went through. I taught a lot of group fitness classes over five years, and when I was first teaching them, I mean, you're always hot and sweaty in there. So I was always, you know, wearing cut off shirts when I would teach classes, and I just went through a few experiences where I was told that I'm big. I mean, more often than not, I was told you're big and scary looking and hearing that they, no one means any harm. Everyone's joking around about it. But when you keep hearing how muscular and scary and intimidating you look, it's like, OK, I'm just going to hide my muscles now. So from from me hearing that for so long, I stopped wearing cut off teachers when I taught group fitness classes just so I can. I don't want people to look at me as like some big, scary figure. I want to be like. And again, I kind of hope I, I suppress myself in a way because I want to be able to show what I work hard for. But, but yeah, um, that that was a story with that. I kind of ended up just making my style more chill, so I don't have to scare anybody. Pretty much, I don't know. Yeah, and that might not be a white man of the same size might not experience that same kind of stereotype. <clears throat> They're scary. They might not get that adjective attached to them. Yeah, and for me, it was just like it, again, no, no one did anything wrong. It was just like. Now they know that these things are maybe a little bit wrong, but hearing that over and over again, it's like, okay, let me just change my clothing. And it's been like that, even with 
you know, a lot of shoots I do, I just want to always wear something chill and long sleeve. It's really just how I am now, but it's weird that that's how I've changed because of that narrative. I can, I can relate. I can relate to that. I, I won't, I won't elaborate, but I'm just letting you know, Paul, that I, I can relate to that, especially yeah. because I, I was a baseball player and I play, I, I was, I was the black kid um, on an all white baseball team for 15 years of playing baseball. <laughs> so I yeah. can, I can relate. That's, you can write a, probably a whole book on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Kate's next question. I'm like, I'm like, I'm gonna go into it when Kate. Asks. No, it's all yeah. good. Yeah, it's a conversation, and someone may not ever have thought that <laughs> saying, "Oh, you look scary," is something that you internalize in a way that another person might not, and that's why, yeah. why we're doing this. Why we're having this conversation. So, exactly. we're, you know, don't worry about the next question. If you want to go off on on a story or a tangent, full permission. <laughs> well, I'll say this then. So, so for me, um, my. <laughs> My story has been one of massive amounts of confusion and feeling like I don't really belong anywhere. Because with my black friends, I'm not black enough. With my white friends, I'm just the black guy. Um, I, I'm, I'm half Mexican, my dad is a Mexican man, and my mom is a black woman. <clears throat> and, um, and so therefore I came out looking like this. And um, that being- Beautifully. Said, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> But uh, I think I think the point is that um, playing sports, playing baseball, my entire life, the the thing that really stuck with me, um, and I had, and I've, and since since these stuff, this stuff happened, it was primarily sort of high school and college playing ball, and it was all of my teammates were for some reason they just couldn't stop reminding me about how different I was, and um, they just they just couldn't stop pointing out how I'm this and look at you, look at me and look at that. And I just always, it always stuck with me. I didn't fully understand it at the time. It, it didn't even make me feel bad at the time because I didn't know what to do with that information. Um, it wasn't until sort of later when I was able to actually have the cognitive ability to sort of decipher and understand and, and sort of reflect on my experiences that I realized like, yo, that was like super racist and that was a horrible thing to say. Um, and so I have a ton of experience like that where if you play basketball, you play football, you're gonna have a decent amount of black teammates. You'll have, you'll have white teammates too. Um, but with baseball, it's, it's dominantly, uh, heavily a, a white sport. Um, I think until you get up to the majors and then you know, you're looking at a lot of Latinos. Um, but um, that, that was my experience and I couldn't for the life of me figure out um, why I just consistently felt like I didn't belong, why there was something clearly wrong with me um, and that, that went all the way up through college and uh, I didn't grow up with privilege. You know, I grew, I grew up in a very humble home. I had to buy my own car when I was 19 years old. I bought a, I bought a car for 1900 bucks with a hundred thousand miles on it. Um, so now I'm the black kid with a crappy car, but it's so, sort of, I'm, I'm, all my circumstances sort of lined up with a stereotypical, you're the black guy. And for the life of me, all I wanted to do, uh, was have friends and fit in. And so that for me, those experiences I've, I haven't forgot about them, but they don't haunt me the way they used to. I've sort of found my way to, to deal with them in a healthy way. But it is, it, it is those sorts of things at a young age that help me to develop a certain amount of perspective, a lack of BS in these categories, and then also really trying to promote in, uh, uh, being inclusive and trying to promote um, diversity in a major way. And, and um, it, it wasn't my Hispanic or Asian or black or... Um, Middle Eastern, it was it wasn't them pointing out my differences. It was it was specifically one race of people, and they just continue to remind me. And so um, that is my experience. And I'm not here to point the finger, but I just want to say that it's very real when um, not only aren't you represented and nobody looks like you, but on top of that, your teammates they they want to consistently remind you about how different you are. Um, and I'll pause there because I'm, I'm going to elaborate some more later on. But I think I think that this sort of a discussion is massively healthy because we have the opportunity to sort of share what we've been through. Um, and um, so so that's I'll just I'll just pause there. But that's kind of where it's at as of right now. Thank you for sharing that experience. Um, that's not easy for any child to go through. And I can definitely see how you bring what you talked about is wanting to bring your positive energy and your diversity 
and inclusion into your workouts and into the way you coach and teach. And that comes through in every class I've ever taken with you. So I love that you've been able to channel that in a really positive way. Um, that actually segues really well into my next question, which was, Jared, when we got on the phone last week, um, one of the first things you said was the darker your skin in America, the harder your life is. And I was just hoping we could touch on that a little bit. And it's it's in terms of fitness, but it's also out, outside of terms of fitness. So, Jared, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you want to elaborate on, on what you said to me? Yeah. So, again, right, just going back, like my mom is a black woman. My mom's <clears throat> I, 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 on my dad's side, on my Mexican side, my dad only has a brother and his brother had never had any kids. So I don't have any first cousins on my Mexican side of the family. All my first cousins are black. They're Paul's skin tone and darker. And so in, in comparison with my family members, right, we're clearly sort of the light skinned black folks in my family. But um, growing up with black cousins, um, there's, there, there's just this incredible amount of misunderstanding. Um, you know, we think you're, you're big, you're tough, you're, you're loud, you rap, you're probably, you know, you, you care about money and bling. And there, there's, there's all this specific preconceived notion that just gets glued onto dark-skinned people. And the truth is that dark-skinned people, just like everybody else, we're sensitive. We, 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 we're creative. We, we care about nurturing and, and all, all the other growing plants and cooking delicious food and being healthy and traveling and so forth and so forth. So the thing that I've come to learn is that through the stories that my cousins have shared with me, um, they have had it far worse than I have. I've been pulled over by the, by the cops driving for no reason. I've done nothing wrong. That's happened to me twice in my life. I've been walking down the street uh, and the sun is setting. It's not dark yet. It's just me. Um, and I've had people cross to the other side of the street before COVID-19. I've had people cross to the other side of the street because they saw a dark shadow from a distance. That's sort of low key, but that's still discrimination. And and I can keep going and keep going and keep going about those different experiences that I've had. But the bottom line is that my discriminatory experiences and racism is nothing compared to my cousins who are darker skin than I am. And so I started doing my homework. I started learning some more about like, yo, is this really a thing? Because they're telling me it's a thing, but I'm kind of like not really buying it just yet. I'm thinking, yo, maybe you were selling weed or maybe you were like, probably something was going wrong. And the truth is that there are good people who weren't doing anything wrong. And so this has kind of been the history of humanity, specifically the history of America, where we've uh, there's been these these sort of glued comparisons to where I looked this up. It's like um, you know, devil's food cake is black, right? But we call it devil's food. That's not on accident. Um, blackmail, right? Um, to blackball, uh, you wear black to a funeral. Um, right, like, and you take the flip side to where, where, um, you know, like the president doesn't live in the black house, right? The president, the president lives in the white house, and and at, at a wedding you wear white, and angels are white, and like th this has been happening for centuries, and it's just sort of embedded in us, and and it has a lot to do with going, and this is where I, I kind of have to go back to like the start of our country, but the truth is that, you know. When black folks were brought into this country against their will and they were stripped of their name and stripped of their identity, um, it, it, there had to be a good and a bad and a right and a wrong and a, and, a, and a be like this and here's the villain. And I think that that sort of carried on and it still continues today. Um, people who don't know think racism is much better. And it's not maybe as blatant as maybe it was in the 60s and 50s. I get that, you know. But um, I think if you're really paying attention, you understand that it's still happening all the time. And so I think, I think to this question, um, it's, it has been in the history of our country, in the history of humanity, where the workers were out and, and getting the sun on their back, and they're darker, and those who have privilege are a lot more fair-skinned. And this has been a thing. Um, and so I guess what I wanted to say about this in particular is that there, there's, a, there's a charge with people. You're at the grocery store, you're at the gas station, you're at the 7-Eleven running an errand, and you see a black person, and if they're dark-skinned, there's just this immediate sort of, I need to kind of <clears throat> myself. And I understand being safe. I understand that the person's a shady character, but I want to really encourage people, rather than, rather than sort of reacting and immediately taking your preconceived notion to a place of negativity and danger, and something's going to happen because there's a black person, I would encourage people to take a moment 
to just see this person. Don't just see their color and immediately assume you know everything about them. Rather, see what they're wearing. How are they expressing themselves? How are they acting? What's their energy like? <clears throat> I think um, this has been a big thing with the dark skin population because, again, I don't get it as bad. I still get it, but it's not nearly as blatant as I'm sure, Paul, you could explain that you've had some pretty blatant, insane things go down. And so that's that's sort of my point. Um, and I just want I just want there to be an awareness as to what it's actually like versus what maybe the news is telling us or versus what we might think it's like. The truth is it's still very much so happening. Thank you. Go ahead, Paul. Just I was gonna lightly elaborate on that, and I'll just have the weird thought because like African cultures, like in Nigeria, they're super proud of their darkness and their blackness. And then my culture in Jamaica, we are too, but in Jamaica, it's like the darker you are, the uglier you are. And if you're light skinned, light skinned, you're gonna be treated like you're the prettier person. But again, they were colonized by a white, I feel like they're colonized by a white country. Most countries colonized by, that are colonized by white countries, I feel like that's the narrative. Your color is ugly and that's been since hundreds of years ago. But that's just a thought that I had just because from my country, I think, and it's not just in America, you know, a lot of these places, like the lighter you are, the prettier you are, but in like where we come from, literally, it's pretty to be darker and darker. The darker you are, the prettier you are, pretty much. That's just a thought I had on that. Cause you, you nailed it, Jared, you, you, had a, you had a lot of great points with that. <clears throat> Even I lived in Cambodia for, for a couple of years and also colonized by the French and the darker you were meant the poorer you were and people were constantly bleaching their skin in really unhealthy ways so that they could get the perception that they were lighter. And so you're right, yeah. it happen in m multiple cultures, but we think, oh, that doesn't happen in America. We're so far along, we're so progressive, but your experiences say otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, moving on, um, Paul, you were a collegiate athlete. You had a very successful <clears throat> career, college career at Illinois State University, and you even played professionally abroad after college. Um, there's a lot of talk about whether college athletes should be paid or not. Um, and I'd love to hear your perspective, your reason why or why not, and how race plays into that. And how race plays into that. Well, I just remember for me, I'm putting myself back in college. We'd always have conversations about we're, we're the ones we are why these people are here. We are why they're buying these tickets. Also, we're helping them create a lot of memories that they're gonna have for life, that they're gonna tell their families about. So the narrative for us is always, we knew we were like, the reason why this is you know a big thing, why people are spending money and spending their whole days watching these games. And we weren't really talking about back then, we need to get paid. But now I have a very strong opinion about that because it's such a booming business more so than it was 10 years ago college football, NFL football. And I feel like if any school is making a significant profit off of what the off of what their team provides that school, then I think that should be allocated and spread out to the people who are putting that hard work in on the ground level. But I mean, again, NCAA football, they're making so much money. But again, they're making this money and these these teams, it seems like they get better every year. I, I, I don't know. But the, 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 the college football athlete right now, of course, like when you think of a receiver, when you think of like, you're not going to recruit, obviously, there's a look to the athlete that plays college football, the skill position players, and also with quarterbacks too, there's like a fetish, not fetish, but there's like a way of a black quarterback. So this is why the sport's growing, because there's more athletes, more, you know, black people in these positions, but I mean, and that's why they should get paid too, because schools are making this, these profits. So it's like, let that dwindle down to us kids. No, I mean, I'm not them, but yeah. Well, back in the old days when you were a kid. <laughs> back, in, back in the old days, but yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a, it's like, I mean, I was a football player. So like I anticipate the games like four days before. It's like such a, it's, an, it's America's, I mean, they say baseball is America's pastime, but football is really like, the main sport in America, it's it's so powerful, but but again, it's a, there's a big narrative behind why it's powerful and who's making it popular and powerful. And who's making the money off of it and what their skin yeah. tone is versus the, the kids who are playing and their backgrounds and where they come from. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, 
it's deep. It goes real deep. But I mean, I definitely think they should get paid for sure. Like, I don't get mad when I hear about some kid. I don't doesn't it doesn't matter. He's gonna end up making millions of dollars for that school, that basketball program, inevitably. So, if he got some shoes or something, it's okay. It's fine. Yeah, and he's he's not gonna have any time, any any free time to have a job if he needs to make extra cash on the side. Yeah, you have you have no life as a college athlete at the same time as well, and that's another thought. You get stipends, even for me, and my stipend. Every school is different, but that stipend is not enough. You can feed yourself, you know. You can maybe go out to the movies, but it's not enough to live a full, thorough college life and experience everything that college can offer. So that's another reason why they need to get paid more on top of that stipend check that they get. Absolutely. Jerry, did you have anything that you wanted to add to this? Uh, on this one. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, my next question is for you, Jerry. Um, so you train a lot of your clients one-on-one -on -one and in group settings. Um, and I know just from taking your classes on tonal that you really focus on holistic health, mental, emotional, and physical. And we know that, well, at least, you know, I'm learning, racism can play a detrimental toll on your mental and, and emotional health that can impact your physical health. Um, and as a coach, I just am wondering how you, one, take care of your mental, emo emotional, and physical health um, and that of your clients who might be people of color? I think that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll answer first on what do I do for my mental health, my emotional health, things like that. So um, I want to go back a little bit. I think sports for me at a young age, um, I, I was fortunate enough to be, um, I had a lot of talent and be a great athlete at a young age. So I was always an all-star. I was always uh, consistently doing well and shining. And I think that th those experiences as a, as a six, seven, eight, nine, 13 year old, um, that taught me that I was capable of doing great things. It taught me that um, I could um, work hard and achieve things and develop confidence. That really did a number on, on my sort of self-belief and knowing that I could be somebody or do things that made a difference. And then I fast forward um, into a lot of different experiences. And, um, and then I, I, when I was in college and I was playing baseball at San Diego state, um, that was probably my low point because I, I found myself just massively confused about who I was. Um, I didn't have any sort of awareness or attention to my mental or my emotional health at all. And so I went through, um, two back to back, really deep, dark depressions, and it was a really tough time for me. So so that low point ended up being the, one of the best things to ever happen to me because it was at that point, it was when I was, um, I was 20, I was 20 and, um, and I started to carve myself out and I started to learn about the power of positive thinking. I started to learn about this thing called emotional health and this thing called mental health. Like what? No one ever told me anything about that. And so that, so that's what really sparked it. So, so from the very beginning, I went through a lot of pain and I had a lot of opportunities to feel what it was like to, to hit rock bottom, to not have any friends, to not get any girls, to not do well in school, to not like nothing was going right for me. And so I was highly motivated to, to be a better version of myself. And so it was that that allowed me to, uh, to come out. And so what I do these days, fast forwarding to these days, is I wake up at about 5 a.m. every day, uh, even during COVID-19, uh, which means I go to bed at 8 o'clock. <laughs> And, um, and so I wake up in the morning and um, the first thing I do is I, I go into my breath work. So I've personally, I've learned that oxygenation, um, as simple as this may sound, to oxygenate your system for just one, two, four, five minutes can literally shift any current state that you might be in. You're worried about something, you're tired, doesn't matter what it is. Simply oxygenating is crazy beneficial. So I wake up, it's early, I'm half asleep, I'm not a big coffee drinker, so I oxygenate and I breathe. The second thing I do is I repeat my affirmations. So this is um, when we, this whole thing about like when, when we watch the Super Bowl and they turn the commercials up like 50 volumes louder, they're trying to embed and bury this in your psyche and I'm like, let's take the same sort of an idea and let's embed positivity, uh, self-love, uh, who am I, where do I want to go? So I, I say affirmations every day. The affirmations are financial, they're personal, they're professional, 
Um, and so it's the breath work, the affirmations, and then physical movement. I just move my body almost every day. Um, that allows me to deal with my emotions as well as it allows me to bring the best version of myself every single day. And so I just took those, um, I took those items and I just started to sort of sprinkle them into my, my classes. So start, I just wanted to kind of see how it was uh, received. And, and it turns out that, that people are, are craving, they're, they're not only craving a, a kick-ass workout, something badass, but they, they, they want some substance. They want to feel like they know you a little bit. They want to feel like they're somewhat connected to you. You said something, you got a reaction. And so for me, it's those items. It's, it's, it's teaching simple um, techniques like how to breathe, uh, and what's, it, what's a talk to yourself, how to, how to talk to yourself in the midst of, of adversity and challenge. And those things go a long way. And the thing is that no one taught me that stuff. I had to learn it the hard way. And I had to suffer in order to learn it. And so I'm massively determined and motivated to make sure that anybody who works with me or talks with me or is friends with me knows that uh, I'm down to talk about it and I would love to try to build and uplift. And so those are the things I do. And I think those things are equally important, if not more important, than the actual workout themselves. Absolutely. And Paul, I know that we've had a lot of conversations um, within the last week and um, you've expressed that you feel angry and a little overwhelmed at times uh, with in light of everything going on. How are you taking care of yourself and how are you channeling that energy? <clears throat> oh, I can't hear you, Paul. I lost a bit. I lost your mic. Hang on. There we go. You're good. I, I got you. <laughs> I muted myself so I can not let the beeping outside get in the way. But I'm actually not taking care of myself at all. I'm still working on that day-to-day um, -day process. And as far as my, my anger, I mean, I wish, I wish like the second I saw or I heard about George, George Floyd, I kind of remember the feeling. I remember when I saw that, it was just like, like that. But at the same time, I feel bad as a black man. I'm almost desensitized to that news because you hear it so much all the time. And I wish I was angrier at that second that's that right when i saw it so that i don't know because i i just kind of feel bad that's i'm desensitized by that news now but as far as my like the feeling of me being angry that's really come about i mean after everything that's unfolded from the police brutality and george floyd dying and then me looking at my life and who's in my life and th that's when those feelings of anger came about. Because again, we've all been unpeeling layers day by day about people we love, companies we love. We're seeing things happen all the time. But it's more so, again, I'm always trying to mm -hmm. stay in a place of empathy, be empathetic. But uh, you know, again, I, it is hard to balance all these emotions and feelings when you see someone lose their life like that. And when you see you know, how your loved ones with how they feel about that and the narrative and, and these conversations can get real heavy. But as far as myself, I think it's important. I told someone told me today, like, try to just turn your phone off for an hour or turn your phone off at some point in the day because I am on my phone a lot, trying to be that person that's empathetic for whoever maybe has been silent, maybe doesn't, maybe has been oblivious to things they been doing their whole life. I've been trying to be that person for a lot of people, but again, I have to kind of step back and take care of myself too. But even though in this situation, I'm finding out things about myself that I really got to get in tune with and internalize before I really want to be in that position to help other people out. But is this all learning situation that is heavy, but I'm again, always trying to be empathetic and stay and lead with that empathy kind of. It's, it's definitely a learning process for everyone. And I know your friends, myself included, thank you and appreciate you for the hard conversations. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> um, that actually segues really well into my next question. Um, when you talk about kind of the silence that you experienced from your white friends and your white fitness community before, um, I know myself, I've been doing a lot of listening and learning and reflecting and um, introspective work. Um, and the, something that I keep hearing come up in a new light is uh, the Colin Kaepernick kneeling when he knelt for the national anthem because he was protesting police brutality. 
Um, and he got a lot of flack for that. He got fired. He lost his job from the, with the NFL for that. And I think that conversation is coming back again. And people are saying, oh, wait, maybe I wasn't right about that. And that's something we're all learning is like, maybe we weren't right and it's okay to be wrong. And I'd love to hear your perspectives on the Colin Kaepernick situation, what he did, what he experienced, what he went through, um, and your perspectives as black men in fitness. And maybe you'll share an experience or a, a perspective that someone else hasn't heard before. So for me, I want to be there for that person that knows for a fact, maybe they did that. Maybe they were like, oh, he needs to get up. He needs to stand tall. And maybe they didn't know. They didn't try to learn the reason behind why he was doing that. I'm not saying I want to teach somebody that, but I know there's lots of great people that just saw that and really just did not know why he was doing it. They probably just thought he didn't, he didn't like his teammates. Or, I mean, I feel like there are people that maybe could be that oblivious, but I think it's important that we don't, you know, that now that this narrative is coming back up, that those people that weren't supporting him, that we don't bash them all, that we, again, find out where your mindset was at that point. And then again, like you said, listen, learn so they can, they can understand where he was. But for me, it is ironic at the same time that somebody – that had a big platform, was doing something very big, but he got silenced. And now it's like, it's like to be him right now, I don't, I'd, I'd be very interesting. It'd be interesting to have a conversation with Colin Kaepernick because he took his stance back then when nobody, not, and he didn't get the support from the, all the athletes that that are stepping up now, like a big athlete is saying something and LeBron James steps in and says something about Drew Brees. It's like that, it's so crazy how the narrative of all that has completely changed, but I'm just happy again that it's, you know, I can only go back to better late than never, but I, I know that there are a lot of people who just didn't really know why he was doing that, which is a shame. I'm ashamed of that, but now there's no excuse because it's like a new world we're living in. Absolutely. Jared? This this one this was a big one for me and I'm gonna I think maybe I want to just make two points. We got um, don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> go. That's what I said. I can go and I can go and I can go. We'll do a part two. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Say what you gotta gotta say. I think the first point that I want to make is it seems like as Americans we forget we forget that not everyone is the same level of free. We talk, we talk in this country about how free we are. And there are many of us who are completely free. And there are a lot of us who are kind of free. And there are a lot of us who aren't that free at all. And, and, the ones that, and, and it seems to me like this is the place where you, you live to, to be free, to have the American dream, to have opportunity to, to build yourself a better life. No one's giving you anything. You have to earn it and make it happen for yourself. And it just, it's massively confusing to me that a guy like Colin Kaepernick can take a knee during the anthem, specify clearly why he is taking a knee. Um, and that's un-American and that goes against all the rules and that's the worst thing he could have possibly done. And in and, and his response, I'm saying, this is why I'm taking a knee because of police brutality and unarmed black folks are losing their lives. I'm of the school of thought that says like, look, if, a, if there's a black person who's, who's breaking the law, who's doing something wrong, everyone deserves uh, to be held accountable to what's going on. So arrest them, put them in jail, hold them for the, for the crime that maybe they committed, but you don't take their life away. You don't kill them. And so Colin Kaepernick is saying, I'm kneeling in order to, to calmly protest for this thing that's clearly happening and somehow that's un-American. And um, the level of... of uh, it's it's just it's just so the the, the contradictory controlling, um, it's it is just out of this world for me and and so I I agree with Paul. It is better late than never. It's better to have this discussion now than to not have it at all. But I just want to ask people who were on the other side of this, who are now changing their mind. You know, what what was it that that helped you to to actually open up your mind and see? Uh, the truth is, it wasn't that hard to see, but it, but I think it's just it just there's this charge, this trigger of rage, and don't you dare say something. 
I think because it then forces people to look inside and that's hard. It's hard to look inside, but when you're the one who's benefiting off the privilege, if you have to look inside and change something about yourself and change something about your own privilege, that means that you're giving a little bit of your own power away. Who wants to do that? Who wants to, who wants to give some power to somebody? So, I, so there's a certain piece of me that feels like I can understand why there would be some resistance to it. But the bottom line is that um, there's, there's, too much, there's too much keeping score. The teams, the, the teams are in totally opposite directions. And, and the second point I wanted to make is that if, I want to speak specifically to all of like my white brothers and sisters who I'm not angry with. Who, who I'm really happy with and proud of for being here and listening to us. Um, it's very possible that you're going to feel some white guilt, that you're going to think back on conversations that you had or um, things that you might have said or thought or did that maybe now you realize are racist, but at the time you didn't realize are discriminatory. I just want people to know that um, even if that is you, it's important that we don't get paralyzed in our guilt and we just feel bad and do nothing. Part of me coming on here today is not only to share my story and, and, and support you, Paul, as you share your story, um, but to really encourage people to take how you feel and be okay with your feelings. You spoke on that earlier, Kate. And then take that energy, take your feelings and do something. Do something different. Change something. Be a part of creating change. Because if we don't change something, it stays the same and we continue to have the discussions and... If, if we just go in circles. And so I want to be a voice and an advocate for taking action today. Uh, that's really important to me. We should, we, we deserve as a people, we are better than this. And, um, and I want people to really be inspired that your, your actions, your voice, your thoughts, it, it does matter whether, how, no matter how small the gesture. And I want to really encourage people to take action immediately. Absolutely. I mean, there's, a lot to unpack and everything you just said and very well said. Thank you so much. Um, Paul said something. <laughs> Paul no, said I, 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 I just read a comment, but I mean, that, <laughs> that go that comment aligns with what Jared just just said. It's like, I don't go ahead. I don't want to in, interrupt you. What you had to say. Go ahead. No, I mean, someone said white guilt here every day, which again, that's I have black friends that know kind of what my narrative is, my mission is, and I want to help people that have that guilt. I want to ask you questions. Why do you have that guilt? And, but just for that person is like <clears throat> this community and us coaches and the people that are super empath empathetic, like we are, do want to help you look deeper into that guilt or look deeper into the actions that, like Jared said, that might've been you know, covertly racist, but you didn't know that at the time. And, you know, we're all got to do things that are hard. Just like me speaking English right now on this. It's hard, but I'm doing it. You know, I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely learning curves and bumps along the way for everyone. And, you know, that's why we're doing this. That's why we're having this conversation. And like we said, we're not going to say everything right, but it's better than saying nothing at all. Without question. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong with feeling guilty either or feeling silent. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just important that I think you just sit with that, internalize that, absorb it, and don't act on it, you know, because I think that's one thing people do a lot. They don't think before they act. So absorb the feelings, because I need to work on that myself. Um, this is a good reminder for people. And, and if I could just say one thing also, like <laughs> me, me growing up in a, in a black and Mexican home, like, um, I want to, again, I just want to specifically speak to white folks, but like, I'm still learning too. There, this, this process has taught me a lot about my own culture. It's taught me a lot about stuff going on. Um, so, so as, as, as you folks are really, you know, you're this absorbing sponge and you're really embracing it all. I think that's awesome. But um, I think the, the remedy, the, the, the antidote to guilt is giving. Uh, contributing. And when you contribute and when you give uh, beyond something that is that you will benefit from directly, that that is how you you bring that sense of accomplishment into your day or into your moments. And um, and so as you're learning, I want you to know that I am also learning, and I am also guilty of um, 
of, be, of discriminating against my own people, not recently, but this, this was a thing that I used to do. And I didn't realize because I didn't have the awareness, the education, the knowledge, and my mind wasn't open the way it should have been. And uh, so, so I just want that to be clear that, that, you know, we're very much so still, still learning as I am, still learning from this. There's been a lot of pain for everyone, um, no matter your skin color, especially our brothers and sisters who are black. Um, and I think we can all just hope that the pain is going to bring about change and that we're, we're all working towards a better and more just country, hopefully world. And I think it starts in our communities. Absolutely. Like the tonal community. <laughs> um, okay. I want to give, I want to save a little bit of time for questions and an answers. Um, we're, we're, I want to wrap up, but before we wrap up, I just, Want to say? I want to ask if either of you have like a simple message that you would want to. If, if someone were to take one thing out of this tonal talk, if you had one little nugget to drop for people, what would that be? Whoever wants to go first can go first. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first. I mean, I, I I'm just I'm going to kind of um, go on loop here a little bit. I'm going to repeat myself, but I, I think that the one thing that I would like people to take away from this um, is. Um, is is a is is a urgency to um, to act. That is the one thing. Um, and there are there are several ways to act. Um, you can contribute with your money and give uh, give money to foundations, um, or you can support black business. Um, you, there there are a lot of different ways that people can right. That's financially, or you can contribute and give your time, um, or you can um, do if you if you are a um, someone of um, a leadership role within your company or within whatever you do for work, you can begin to implement programs or systems that encourage uh, that encourage openness and sharing and contribution. I mean, there, 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 are, there are a thousand different things that, that we can do, but I think I want to encourage people to take all of this and to find a way to implement uplift and, and increases in health and awareness, of, of course, with black people. Um, but with all people of color, and um, and um, so that, that's that's really what I want people to take out of this is that your contributions really do matter. They affect what Paul said. They affect the next generation. And uh, and just know that even though I not know exactly what you're doing, uh, I want you to know that I appreciate the contribution to to progress. Beautiful, Paul. What's your nugget? Um, I would say. Well, can you repeat the question? I want to leave them with something impactful. Like if, you were, if you wanted someone to take away, you know, go to dinner with their family after this, <clears throat> you know, Coach Paul taught me this on, on that tournament. Got it. Well, I've always, even now, I mean, we're getting a chance to express ourselves. And I would, I feel like I could talk about this for 30 straight minutes, but I just want to be able to have y'all feel me as much as you can. But with this whole situation, I say this with training, Anything in life, I always choose the hard way out. I know Jared mentioned about donating to Black Lives Matter. If you're gonna do it to them or any anybody, just make sure that you have a, a good reason why you're gonna donate. Because to me, as a black man, my story is so black, I still feel like I'm not understood a lot in this community, in this industry, in my area. But just as a black man, is to me, it's easy for people to donate. It's the easiest thing to do. It's easy to call somebody up and just try to have a conversation and then give up if it gets too hard. You know what I think what's hard to do is doing the hard things is where we grow physically, mentally, emotionally. So if it's hard to call that person back, someone said about having that conversation with their 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 vet father, if it's hard to call them back and do that, that might be what you have to do so you can unpeel back layers of yourself, your communication skills, and your family. Or if it's hard to call up your one black, I have a lot, of, I'm the only black friend for a lot of white people. And I have, and a lot of people, I know they're terrified to hit me up, but it, that might be what you have, just try to do it. And maybe I don't want to pick up the phone, but that's a message to me, even in itself, but not even just the phone, like putting your feet on the pavement, going outside, marching, protesting. I think that's a strong action. If you have never done that before, just doing things that aren't easy, is what I want to leave people with, whether you're doing it on tonal 
or off a tone will choose the hard way out always. That's how you get stronger. You got to break down to build stronger. We know that. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, last question, Jared, what does it mean for you to be your strongest? You got 30 seconds. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we got more than that. Uh, Paul, you gave such a solid answer, man. I think, I think that that's literally where I would go with it, with my response to your question, Kate, what it means for me to be my, to be my strongest means I do things that are inconvenient, difficult, and hard in order to, to do what's right. Um, that's, that's being my strongest. Paul, what's it mean for you to be your strongest? Be yeah, my strongest. Um, I think this relates to like my world now, but just staying strong, staying firm in your belief system when your world's crashing down. Not that that's happening to me, but just staying firm and not giving up when that is the easiest thing to do to quit. Yeah. Amazing. You're both. Thank you so much. Um, I want to answer, I want to get to a couple questions from our community members. Derek Witherspoon. Hi, Derek. Derek says, oh no, I lost it. He says, coaches, do you feel the movement taking place today concerning George Floyd's death will continue to grow or fade away? I'm sorry, Derek, my phone is not letting me click to the rest of your, oh, continue to grow or fade away as usual. Um, Paul, I'm going to give you this one and then Jared, you can answer. It'll fade away for sure. And there will be another black person that gets killed by a cop for sure. I don't think this, this one's going to be the last one ever, but I, I know that because there's going to be laws changing, everyone's values are going to be changing too, that I just hope it won't happen as frequently. So, okay. but that's how, I, that's how I feel about it. So okay. yeah. I, I think I agree. I think this will fade away as, as everything does. It, it'll lose a bit of steam, but, um, this one seems to be a little different for me, um, in my opinion. I, I think that people um, are outraged and fed up, at least maybe not all people, but in a way that we haven't seen. There's a lot of new stuff. We're, we're seeing police officers kneel. We're seeing, um, we're seeing white folks calling out other white folks. Uh, we're, I, I think in, in, from my experience, we're seeing things that, that I don't know that I've ever really seen before. So I think that there will be some lasting change, but I think we know that big change happens really slowly. So I also think there's going to be another unarmed black person who gets killed by the police and it's going to be, I think, I think it'll continue to happen, but I think, uh, I think it will, I think it will be a little bit better in my opinion. Well, I think a follow-up question as a white woman, what can we do to keep the conversation going? To yeah. keep the conversation going with friends, family, co -work. I mean, just to keep it going in general. Um, what can they do, Jared? What can we do to keep this from fading and just being another news cycle? I, I would, I would, I would honestly. I'm not trying to like throw this back on you, Kate. I'm just saying to white people, put change, change this, flip this for um, get rid of black folks and insert your best friend. What would you do for your best friend? What, what, would, what would you do if your best friend was constantly discriminated against X, Y, Z, blah, blah? That to me changes the question. That to me opens up a, a much more clear lane of what I can do. Well, what, if my best friend's getting targeted, what I would do is I would make sure that my best friend um, has like, you know, a friend or, or, or family member's number on speed dial. I would, make sure, I would make sure my best friend doesn't go out at nighttime. I would make sure my best friend knows that they are educated and they can talk to me about certain things. I would make sure my best friend knows that, I, that they have their back, or if I, if I confide in them, that there will be consequences for, for bad or destructive behavior. For me, um, I, I, want, I really want to, to get white folks to stop asking black people to, to solve this. I want, I want, you guys are just as intelligent as anybody else. I want, I want to encourage white folks to, to think about what they would do for their dog, what they would do for their, for their spouse or for their family member. That's what you can do. Um, you go above and beyond and really care. Start giving um, a lot. And I also think people can try to feel what everyone that's super sad, super angry, super upset about the situation is feeling. Again, by continuing to doing what they're doing, absorbing what they're seeing. But the more, the more people can understand the feelings of why people are out there marching, looting, protesting, 
the more we're all gonna again get together, be one. But I, I wanna some real quick, I feel like people misunderstood what I said um a second ago about I, I, I know this is gonna get better, but I'm my story is very black and I just know next month it could be something just like that. I know inevitably there will be change. I just know that there will there will be another black man unarmed that gets murdered in this country. But I know that there will be change. And like, well, my kids are out here in this world as young adults. It will be a new world that's still evolving because as Jared said, change, big change takes a super, super long time. And that's why it's important, like I already said, to absorb this situation as much as you can. Absolutely. Nicole Jenny says, vote, vote, vote. And I fully agree. Thank you, Nicole. Um, all right, we are at time. We, I mean, we could have kept going for, I feel like hours. So uh, hour, uh, <laughs> to do a part two, and that's another way we can keep the conversation going and keep the momentum. Uh, who wants a part two? Put yeah. it in the comments. Yeah. Let us in the comments if you want a part two. Uh, we, can, uh, we can get more. We didn't say anything about Black Lives Matter. I had a lot to say about that, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. Um, you can find Coach Jared and Coach Paul both in the group and on Instagram. Their Instagram handles are on the trainer. So if you click into their, their bios, you'll see it and on the mobile app. Um, Coach Jared, Coach Paul, thank you so much for sharing yourselves, your experiences, your perspectives with us. I learned a lot. I know people express that they learned a lot in the comments. So I just can't thank you enough for your bravery, bravery your vulnerability, and for your time. Thank you, Jared, for your insight. And I always have said this to you, you're, you have a way with your words, just like right now. So I appreciate your energy. Okay, I appreciate you putting this together. And all you a phone call too, Jared. I love you, man. I'm gonna call you back, I promise. I'm <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I also, I'm, I'm also super grateful, Paul. Thank you too, man. I appreciate your insight as well. And I, I appreciate you, Kate, and I appreciate Tonal because the truth is that you, you guys are giving us a platform in order to share our experiences. and. One of the things that I didn't want to happen, I didn't want this to sound whiny or like we were pointing a finger at any one person in particular. I wanted this to really be a thing where we just share what we have been going through and what we are going through. And so I'm really grateful and uh, I appreciate everything. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you both so much. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We will be back next week for a Tonal Lab on keeping your knees healthy and happy with Coach Liz. Thank you everyone. All right, y'all. See you later. <laughs>